All right. We got voicemails to go through. Anchor.fm slash the CU podcast. Leave us a short message. Make fun of my hair. Comment on Ian's lovely orange-yellow shirt. You can do whatever you want. Here's the first one. Hi, Pat and Ian. This is Chris from Fort Wayne, Indiana. And out of curiosity, what is your favorite model of the TurboGrafx slash PC Engine console? Me personally, I happen to like the PC Engine Super Graphics, probably because it looks less like a video game console and more like something you could unfold to play Electronic Battleship. Yeah, with. yeah, it does. Just, but what are one of your favorites? Yeah, Chris, that's a ridiculous. Uh, that's like, the, yeah, that's, when you look at that, you're like, is that a weapon? The, the Super so we, we talked about that. Uh, we well, talked about we that did. last week a little bit. Okay. Um, the, you we know, did. That's right. How silly they look. Uh, yeah, I'm not a super graphics fan. I also do not like the shuttle, which everyone seems to love. Everyone it's loves weird. the shuttle. I'm not a huge fan of it. Uh, I'm pretty basic. The PC Engine Duo R is my favorite. Uh, I, I I guess if you want me to get real specific, I kind of like the RX a little bit more because I like the blue accents on the controller. Sure. Hey, Pat and Ian. It's Sean from Erie, PA. If you could please give a shout out to my brothers, that'd be awesome. Hey, brothers. Their names are also Pat and Ian. What was it? Was this guy doing? A, is, he, is this guy like on a vocoder? What's happening here? On a mixer? <laughs> I don't know. That's why. What, what? Shout out, Pat and Ian. My names are also Pat and Ian. Whoa. Both of you, my question is Do you ever find yourself wanting to play an original game cartridge, but for preservation's sake, decide not to because of its value? Thanks and keep up the great work. The value! No. I I, I mean, we played on the mar- second marathon, we played both NWC cards. So, I mean, I don't. I mean, they're not going to get damaged playing them. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I, no, not really. If I, I have mean, them, I it's it's to play them, and I, I whatever. A, a cartridge is not going to get damaged playing it. I mean, it's kind well, of, I'm sure he means CDs and whatever too. But I, I, it's kind I of, yeah, I, I, you know I, what you're doing. It's not going to damage. Yeah, I, I use my yeah. I use my sapphire. Hi, Pat and Ian. This is Peter from Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. Uh, just a question about uh, what do you think would be like the most ultimate new console if you were to take up the reins like tommy telemico has and what what would your ideal <laughs> console <laughs> look like well we, we can't avoid it um i, I like i said before I I, I, it wouldn't I, I have no desire to make a new ultimate console because there, it's just been well, first of all there's no such thing as an ultimate console it's done there's and really well, no such thing. right and at this there point you know we're, we're beyond like polygons and we're beyond you know sprite how many sprites on screen it gets uh what, what my my ultimate console is a switch with a few more third parties on it like i mean that's that's it i yeah. I, I don't I'm even know pa- how to I, I, I don't know how to the, tackle that question the switch pro that gets finally a gta game on it if i said i said the gta comes to the switch there you go i'm happy sure that's it hello pat ian this is will out of chattanooga tennessee, tennessee. And i wanted to ask real quick uh, and get y'all's thoughts on video games in the public domain. And now I understand that we are many, many, many years away from any video games okay. entering public domain. Right. But it is the next major medium that will begin that transition. And I wanted to get y'all's thoughts on what the distant future holds for our favorite characters, just Mario <sighs> and Sonic, and what it'll be like when those characters begin to enter public domain. I think the laws will be constantly changed to keep that from happening. I, I, I think, and I'm not, and I'm pretty neutral on whether that's good or bad because, um, copyright laws have constantly been updated. I'm looking at it right now. It depends on when something was published. Um, so like, for example, Mario was created, um, let's see, he was created in 81. Super Mario Bros. We'll just say was 85. Um, it looks like, for example, that would be the greater of the term specified in the previous entry or December 31st, 2047, or it's 70 years after the death of the author. If a, if a work or corporate authorship, 95 years, there it is, 95 years after the p- publication to, or 120 years from creation, whichever expires first. So there'll be another Super Mario Brothers game that can be made potentially that's 2080. That's probably what you're looking at. Right, that's what it looks like. But they, they, every ten years, they alter this. So there's a reason why, like, like a Disney was responsible supposedly for changing a lot of this because it used to be a little more loosey goosey on copyright. Because at first, what can you copyright? Uh, books and music. Right. That's it. And then all of a sudden, you got the moving pictures, and then you got you know what I mean. Then you have a lot more things. Then you get 
video games that pop up and you get movies and like and TV shows. And so they had to constantly be like, hey, what's reasonable? And I don't know. We're going to be probably gone, but there are there are some weird people I see that said like, oh, uh, internet, uh, they think that there should be no inter intellectual property copyright, that everyone should own anything. How do you own a thought? No, that's ridiculous. Uh, but but we will, we will get to a point in time, in theory, based upon the current laws, where any company can come out with a Super Mario Brothers game. I don't know what that's going to look like or that's going to be prevented. Yeah. But that's going to be strange when you have, because at that point it gets so diluted where I think where then it's not, it has no, basically the point was at some point the, the, the holder can get no more value out of holding the copyright, therefore it expires and anyone else can use it. That's what theoretically why there's a limit to that. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, in theory, it's like, oh, we can't get any more use. I mean, Sherlock Holmes is in public domain because like oh, Doyle wrote that stuff in the 1890s. Right. You know. But like his estate can still try to go after you for some stuff, or they still want money. That's what it comes I was down say to. Say they do have some of that copyrighted or something. Yeah, I like don't know that. how they thought about corporations making Mickey Mouse stuff 150 years after Walt first penned. I have no like, I don't have a good answer for you. I don't. It's gonna be weird. Dogs and cats living together. Uh, <laughs> next one here. Hey, Pat and Ian. Uh, this is Chris from North Carolina. I want to ask if there's any music you maybe used to like, uh, but totally cringe at now. Thanks. Any, Ian? Um, no, not really. I, no, nope. I, I probably have that <laughs> in terms of like, I'm sure there's probably TV shows or something or whatever that I probably used to like that I don't like so much now that I would find cringeworthy. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy with most of the musical choices I've made. A lot of the stuff that I listened to in high school, Orbital, KMFDM, Nine Inch Nails, um, you know, Prodigy. I may not like some of that stuff as much as I did, but I can still throw that on and enjoy it today. Yeah, it's tough for me to listen to the Prodigy nowadays. But it, I, it I depends. First two it, yeah. albums. I can't do Fat of the Land. At least not all the oh, way through. I could through. never do Fat of the Land. That was commercial, commercial Not all the way through. No. But uh, no, nothing, nothing I'm ashamed of. I, I can still listen to stuff. I'm not like... I can still, I can still throw on some happy hardcore. You know, I'm an old man. Hey guys, Brandon from Michigan. My question for both of you is, when you're old and senile and living in the nursing home, what video games or video game systems do you see yourselves playing then? And more generally, do you think video games are going to be a popular hobby in the nursing homes in 40 to 50 years, maybe even surpassing something like bingo? That's an, uh, that's yes. an interesting question. I think we talked about that before. Being that we grew up with this stuff, we would be more likely to play it when we're older. Yes, I, the, yeah. the whole age thing was simply because when video games were introduced, I mean, video games are still very fresh. When video games were introduced, there was entire generations that had not experienced them. Sure. But lots of people like them now. We've proven by the fact that the target market for video games keeps jumping up by 10 years. It used to be kids, and it was 15-year-olds, sure. and it was 25-year-olds, and now it's 45-year-olds. Gen um, X and millennials, yeah. Uh, we're not going to just magically grow out of it. And simple pick-up-and-play stuff. Games like Tetris, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of old ones, but there's modern ones too. Simple pick up and play games are always going to be popular. I could see something like a game. We, we hear stories already about old people who love their Game Boys and get attached yeah. to Tetris or something like that. That's going to continue. That sort of pick up and play gameplay is going to continue to be very popular. Yeah, I don't think the long, like, I don't, I can't picture a 90 year old getting into a game that requires 100 hours, but that might be a little tougher. Maybe to remember some of your faculties. But yeah, simple games. Absolutely. I'm with that right now. I'd rather play a simple game. I can, I can get in and out of it in a half hour. Absolutely. Give you my mappy fix, right? Ian, this is James from the UK. Hi, James. We really missed your Tales of the Video Game Store segment. Um, we haven't had one of those in a while. Wow. Um, but frankly, they promote all of the idiots that come into your shop. Yes. So do you have any humble, lovely stories about oh. people doing nice things? Uh, in your retail experience. Thanks. I'm sure you do, Ian. Heart uh, heartwarming tale. I do, and I've told some of them before. Um, but yeah, really, I'm just kind of trying to stay away from you know the podcast, uh, the, the the shop on here. It's just not worth the hassle. Hey, Pat and Ian, this here is Ox Bigley. Uh, what? Thanks for listening uh, to my message. What? <laughs> anyway, uh, just wanted to know, aside from the obvious, uh, what are you guys into collecting, uh, if anything else at all? Thanks a lot. Love the show. Toys. Ian uh, collect, collects vinyl. I collect bad memories. Um, what else? I get into I get into vinyl. Um, I have a small collection of synthesizers. Um, yeah, that's about it. Used to be into comics. Um, yeah, do a couple more here. 
Hey, Pat and Ian, this is Pat from Boston again. Boston. Ian, thank you for the recommendation about avocado in an omelet. That was mm. quite good. I will <laughs> so certainly good. be doing that again. <laughs> My question's for both of you. Imagine Sega were bought by another company. Who would that company be? Why would they make that purchase? And what would the future <laughs> hold for both Sega and the company who purchased them? Thanks, guys. So we get questions like this about these what ifs. I, I can't wrap my mind around thinking about these what ifs about who would buy Sega and why. And it's tough for me to envision this. I mean, it's I guess, hard for me to do it quickly. Yeah. But I, I feel like and I'm not saying this will happen, but uh, Nintendo, I, Nintendo and Sega have been pretty cozy. Sonic has been in Smash. He's uh, done the Olympics He's with the Olympics Mario a couple a few, times. Right? A few, a few times. A few times. Go back to the Wii. Um, I, you know, I, I could see that. I could see, you know, some of those mascot characters from from Sega interacting with Nintendo mascots. All right. But I don't I, don't, I, I just it wouldn't be yeah. worth Nintendo's time to buy it, though. It honestly they have so much going on. It's yes. like it wouldn't make it probably more sense for like Microsoft to buy them or, or, or it would Sony, make more sense. Yes. Or Sony to buy them, to be honest. There you go. This is we'll like, we've really come up really realized over the past few discussions involving Nintendo and their properties that. Nintendo has more than enough on their plate. They can't make money fast enough, right? basically. They're yeah. not in trouble. Hey, guys. This is Aaron from Hungry Travel by Podcast. Hi, Aaron. I have a question about the homebrew industry. Oh. Do you think it's more beneficial to have homebrew on a system that was very established in its time, like NES or Atari 2600, or a system that kind of found its audience later, like Turbo Graphics or Vectrex? Thanks a lot. You said beneficial. Yeah. To who though? To like, I guess, to the the console's life, or I, I, I think, I think it's it's. I, I think when you release homebrew on a system that everyone knew, like the Nintendo, or you release homebrew on something like the PC Engine, I think you're still probably appealing to roughly the same amount of people. It's only going to be people who are super into that. And I feel like homebrew in general is not something casual people really dip their toe into. I think you have to be into it enough, to, into video games enough, that you probably have a lot of these systems. So it really just comes down to the homebrewer is making a game for whatever system they, they really prefer. Um, so I, I don't know. When you, re, when you homebrew something on the PC Engine, you probably are going to have a lot of rabid fans who want to pick it up if it looks good. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have to think that that it's probably going to equate to similar sales for a, a, a homebrew yeah. NES game. There's, you, there's only so many people who are going to be interested. There's Atari. In it. There's a tons of Atari and uh, ColecoVision homebrews that come out. I can't imagine them cracking even 500 sales for the most popular one. I can't imagine it. I just sure. can't because there's not a lot of huge interest in those markets. At, huge markets there anymore. What did you drop, Ian? Uh, uh, it's fine. Okay, I think I got rid of my drop here. Uh, we got one one more here. Hey, hey, Tommy Tallarico here, sending you a message from my portable Amico, or as the trendy kids call it, my cell phone. Heard you guys talking about how you don't like VR, so I said, hey, you know what the Amico needs? A whole bunch of VR! Doesn't work with a lot of games yet, though. This guy on the team was testing it out with Caveman Ninja, and, you know, my dog started jumping on him, and he got freaked out that it was a dinosaur, and he fell down the stairs, and I got a lot of stairs. <laughs> but he did sign a waiver that said that would probably happen, so, you know, whatever. Then we tried it with the darts game, and that was a big mistake. I'm not even going to get into that. But one game does work so far, and it's just for you, Ian. Uh-oh, it's Mahjong in VR. <laughs> Boom! And whether you want it or not, I'm not even taking your stupid money. Oh. Actually, never mind. You can go ahead and pre-order that. Oh, okay, good. Oh, yeah, DeGrom sucks. Hey, wait a second, Tommy. That's fighting hey, words, hey. Tommy. That's, to that's fighting words, uh, Tommy. You can you can make up lies about meeting me and me kissing your ring or forcing me to kiss the ring or whatever the fuck or say my friends I lost you don't fucking go after the Grom you can say fucking I lost friends because of Miko you don't fucking touch the goat Jacob the Grom pitches I think tonight or tomorrow by the way all right that's all I got. <laughs>